Well, as we begin, let's take a moment to pray. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. Lord God, we praise you for your holiness. We praise you because you are completely different to us. Lord, anything good in us is because we are made in your image. And anything bad in us is rebellion against your holiness. Lord God, you are completely different to us in every way. But yet you came into this world as a man to live the life that we could not live, that holy life, that life of perfection and differentness. Lord Jesus, though you came as one of us and were the same as us in every way, yet you were holy in that you are completely different. You are perfect because whilst you are man, at the same time, you are God. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, for that. We praise you for sending your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we too may be holy, that we may be a people set apart, different, that when we have to do with you, that it is not the same as how we have to do with each other. That when we come to you, that it is completely different from anything we see in this world. Lord God, forgive us for when we have not been holy, for when we have had to do with you in worldly ways, when we have approached you in ways that are not different to how the world approaches things, when we have confused the common and the holy, and even the profane and the holy. Lord, consecrate us afresh as a people. Lord, by the power of your word and spirit, remind us of our calling as a holy people, a priesthood of believers set apart to worship you, to serve you, to bring your message into all the world, the message of gospel hope, but also of transformation and holiness, of a change of mind, of a change to a holy mindset, where we set all things to do at you above the things of the world realizing that you are not just a big version of us. Lord, forgive us for our profanity. Forgive us for not understanding or not even wanting to understand your holiness and for not wanting to be a consecrated people, but just wanting to be the same as everyone else. Lord, forgive us because in this we have denied our calling to holiness. Lord, help us to understand today that call. Give us the power through your word and spirit to fulfill it. And forgive us once more, Lord Jesus, for when we have denied our holiness, denied your holiness in word and thought and action. Bring us deeper in our journey with you, Lord, today. Bring us further along in our exodus. Separate us out from Egypt and bring us a step closer to your promised land. For we ask it in the holy and sacred name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to come to read for you now uh, chapter 13 of the book of Exodus as we continue to look at Israel's holy and sacred journey out of Egypt uh, to the promised land. And of course, it is still early days as they prepare to leave that land of Egypt. This is the word of God. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me whether man or animal. Then Moses said to the people, 
commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today, in the month of Abib, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your forefathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, and on the seventh day hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days. Nothing with yeast in it is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time, year after year. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised on oath to you and your forefathers, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In the days to come, when your son asks you, what, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn in Egypt, both man and animal. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert, towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, armed for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And we thank God for this, his most holy word. Well, let's pray and thank him for what we have read. Lord, we thank you for this, your most holy word, which reminds us that we, the Israel of God, are a people consecrated to yourself, a people called out, and not just called out, but brought out by your mighty hand. We praise and thank you, Lord God, for your mighty hand in our lives, for what you have done for us, 
for how you have enabled us to tell it to our children. We praise and thank you, Lord God, that we have something to tell, that we have a deliverance that we are ready and passionate to speak of. We thank you, Lord God, for equipping us for this purpose. We thank you, Lord God, that you call us out, not just as a one-off event, but as a life's journey. And we thank you that on this journey, that you have been like a pillar of fire ahead of us, leading our way. And a pillar of cloud that guides us and protects us. Thank you, Lord God, for your guidance and protection in the week gone by, by the power of your word and spirit. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the faith and repentance that we have, gifts from you. We thank you for answer to prayer. We thank you for healing. We thank you for giving the gift of faith and repentance to people that we love. And we thank you for how you continue to work in people's lives day in and day out by the power of your mighty hand. We thank you for all who work so hard at this time. We thank you for those, especially on our front line, in our hospitals, in our emergency services, in our police, and for those in the background who do the equally important work of making sure that we have food to eat, of making sure that our land runs in a stable and predictable way. We thank you for those who labour in the work of the gospel, for those whose passion it is to see Jesus lifted high, that he might draw all men to himself. We thank you, Lord God, for equipping us all to serve you in the calling to which you have called us. We thank you for how, over time, you reveal to us your will for our lives and for how you equip us to serve you as we are. We thank you, Lord God, that you do not just simply leave us as we are, but that you conform us to the image of your Son. We thank you, Lord God, for every good gift which comes down from the Father of light, by the power of the Spirit, and in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, as we look at chapter 13, if you want to open your Bibles there, um, and straight away we come across a, a big word and we come across here's a, here's a, here's a difficult word to understand on the chalkboard offside anyone understand that i think maybe there are some people out there who don't understand this offside rule in soccer i've come across people who don't understand it children i wonder if you are into football maybe and it's not always but it's a lot of time it's the boys that are into football more than the girls, isn't it? And I wonder if you might be able to explain to your little sister or your big sister what this means. It seems to be hard to understand, doesn't it, uh, for people who are not into football. And I've seen it many times where someone asks, what's this offside thing? And someone tries to explain it to them and they find it difficult uh, to get. But yet, the person who has a passion and a love for football can explain it, even though it is difficult for someone who doesn't understand or, 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 or maybe doesn't even want to understand. Uh, they're just curious. And I've often seen people try to explain this offside rule to other people and they go, ah, look, <laughs> forget about it. It doesn't really matter because I'm not into football. And you know, we, we understand things like the offside rule because we're into football, because we love it. We don't just pay it lip service. We don't just pretend that we like football and pretend that we're watching it. And because we're passionate about it and we love it, we take time to understand things like this. The word that I really want to talk to you today will be of no interest to people who do not love the Lord Jesus. Only people who are passionate about him, who love him, will want to understand things like this. Just the same as people who are passionate about football will want to understand things like the offside rule. Yes, maybe you can watch a game of football without understanding what offside is, but eventually, if you get really caught up in it, you'll want to know why that goal was disallowed or why the referee made that decision, and you will, you will take time and effort to understand the offside rule. And the same goes for words that we come across in the Bible. These are not 
theological words. What I mean by that is they're not words made up by professors in colleges just to complicate religion. This is the very word of God, and God has uttered this word. And because he has spoken this word into our lives, he wants to understand it. Yes, he could have said it in a maybe smaller, easier word, but he chose not to. The Holy Spirit chose to use this word uh, because he wants to communicate something particular to us. And it's my job, my number one role in life, is the most important thing that I do from dawn till dusk every day is to think about how I will explain these kind of words to you. That's my number one job and my main priority. And to then actually explain them to you. That's the main thing that God has called me to. So let me explain this consecrate word, children, to you, and maybe the adults might even listen in as well. What is it to have something consecrated? Well, the first thing, and I thought about this all week, and I thought about different things that maybe might be consecrated in our lives. And the easiest one I could come up with is the toothbrush. The toothbrush is consecrated. How is the toothbrush consecrated? Well, sometimes when I am staying in my friend's house, I joke with them and I say to them, uh, oh, you have lovely toothbrushes. Thanks for letting me use them. And they'll go, Ugh. and they'll, they'll know, of course, that I'm joking. The idea of using someone else's toothbrush is not good, is it? It's not something that anybody would want to do. If you're staying in someone's house and you said, oh, I forgot my toothbrush, and they says, oh, shall I go ahead and use mine? <laughs> no, you go, no, no, you're okay. I'll just go without. So the idea of putting someone else's toothbrush in your mouth, uh, it's not good, is it? Someone's toothbrush is consecrated to them. It is theirs. And it goes only into their mouth. And it is only used by them, not other people. The thought of using someone else's toothbrush or someone else using your toothbrush, it's not pleasant, is it? If you can understand that, and if your face screws up like mine at the thought of using someone else's toothbrush or someone else using yours, then you're able to understand what consecrated means. Because the toothbrush is consecrated to you and you alone. It is for nobody else. And we are consecrated to God and God alone. We belong to nobody else. No other God, no other deity, no other system of religion, or way of having to do with God can lay claim on us. The Egyptian gods cannot claim us. The God of this world cannot claim us. And we are not to have to do with God in the ways that people have to do with those things. Because we are consecrated to him. We are his, just like this toothbrush is mine. And you know, the Bible says, we will read later on, that God is a jealous God. That just as we are jealous for our toothbrush and don't want other people sticking it in their mouths, that because we're consecrated to him, he is jealous over us. And he does not want us having to do with other gods and other ways of worship that belong to other gods. Another way that the toothbrush is consecrated is that I only use this for brushing my teeth. Now, I have old toothbrushes that I might use for other things. You know, a toothbrush can be very handy. If you've got furniture that has little grooves in it or any kind of surfaces that has, has grooves in it, a toothbrush is very good for cleaning dirt out of those grooves, isn't it? You can get the, 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 the brush uh, right into those wee grooves and get the dust out. But I'm not going to use the toothbrush for a common purpose like that and clean furniture with it and then put it in my mouth, am I? No. So, the toothbrush is consecrated, not only to me, but it is consecrated to brushing my teeth. It is only for brushing my teeth. That's all. It is not for anything else. It's not for cleaning my ears. It's not for cleaning my nose. It's only for cleaning my teeth. Imagine cleaning your ears with your toothbrush and then putting it in your mouth. Imagine cleaning your nose with your toothbrush and then putting it in your mouth. You're not going to do it, are you? No, because it is consecrated to your mouth. It is only for brushing your teeth, not for cleaning the furniture with and then sticking it in your mouth. We are the same as God's consecrated people. And when we have to do with God, we have to do with him in a holy way. The same as our toothbrush has to do just with going into our mouth and cleaning our teeth. 
God has called us to him, to worship him and to serve him in the ways that he has set out and not in any, not in any other way. So when God says we are consecrated, think of the toothbrush. I think the offside rule is harder to understand than the word consecrated. And I think that if you, if you can understand the offside rule, you can understand words like consecrated. There's only one difference. It's what you want to understand, and it's where your heart is. That's the big motivator in understanding these words. We say we love the Lord, but if we love the Lord as much as we love football, we will take time to understand his holy word that wants to teach us that like this toothbrush, we are consecrated as his people for his purposes. So we see here that the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. They are mine. And in the same way, the church is consecrated to God because these firstborn males were symbolic or representative of the church. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So they represented everyone. Later on, the firstborn males would be, God would say, these are my priests. And then he took a tribe to represent them. They were representative. But the whole church is really consecrated to God. Everybody. Everybody who belongs to the church outwardly, even just outwardly. So when God consecrated a people to himself, when he set them aside, he did it before they even believed. And we know this is true in two ways. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, consecrating us, knowing that one day we would be set apart in faith and repentance in him. But before we come to faith, we are outwardly set apart. We are outwardly called. We are called to membership. John Woodside, um, who was my minister in Drada, used to talk about the approach he had to the gospel, which was belong to believe. So he said it was important that we allowed people to belong outwardly to the church and to the community of the church, even before they believed. That it should be okay to, to welcome people, to have to do with them, to involve them in the things that we do as a community. And then through faith and repentance, they would become consecrated to God and able to participate in our more holy activities. You know, before, um, way, way back in the early church, in the fourth century, and this was the practice for actually centuries, for hundreds of years in early Christianity, if you belonged outwardly to the church, if you belonged to believe, if you hadn't yet come to faith and you hadn't yet come to obvious repentance, when it came to the part of service where the communion meal was had, which was every service, they never had a service without it, you were asked to leave. You had to go. Because you had not faith and repentance, you did not, you were not yet consecrated fully to God. You are kind of consecrated by belonging outwardly but not fully and I, I tell you that to give you a picture of the distinction the people of God here were consecrated to God as a people outwardly whether they believed or not he said you are mine but yet he knew that only some of them are really his only some of them were inwardly as well as outwardly consecrated and remember we said that baptism outwardly consecrates us just like the Passover outwardly consecrated the people but it's that inward consecration when the Spirit gives us new birth and we are born again and we have faith and repentance. That is the reality that outward consecration is just a sign of. Outwardly being set apart is one thing, but truly coming to faith and being truly set apart is the reality that these outward things are just a pointer towards. This is why this outward um, this outward consecration is why and what Paul means when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in verse 7 verse uh, 14 that your children are holy so if you if you look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7 and verse 14 you will see that it says there for the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife 
and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. So even though the husband doesn't believe, he's still consecrated or sanctified outwardly. Even though the wife doesn't believe, she is still outwardly consecrated or sanctified through her believing husband. Remember, we looked at household baptism. Because they belong to the household of a believer, they are holy or sanctified. Now, remember, get this idea out of your head, please, of holiness as about being shocking good and very moral and well behaved. That's not what holy means. Holy means being consecrated or set apart. So your children, even though they do not yet believe, are holy simply because they are the children of believers. Just as the unbelieving husband is holy or sanctified, even though he doesn't believe, because he belongs to a covenant household which outwardly belongs to God. Now, that doesn't mean that the unbelieving husband is saved or the unbelieving wife is saved. No, but they participate in the outward benefits of the covenant. In other words, they can see the worship of their believing wife. They can see the worship of their believing husband. And that's why the Lord says later on in verse 16, how do you know then that you will not save your wife or save your husband through them belonging outwardly to the covenant. This is clearly what the scripture shows us about consecration. So it gives us hope. It gives us hope uh, for our children and for the unbelieving members of our family. But the firstborn male here is the one consecrated. And like I have said already, the firstborn male here is set apart. So God says, set apart or consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether man or animal. So we, we see this. And when, when, this, when, this, when this is done um, in, in verse 8, it is about what the Lord has done. So, so the consecration of people is not something that they do themselves. We see uh, in verse 8, that it says, on that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. So we don't consecrate ourselves. It is God who gives the command and it's God who consecrates. It's he who has the power to draw people to himself. And that's why again and again and again, the Passover is not about what we do for God, but about what God has done for us. And the Lord's Supper is not about what we have done for God, about, but about what God has done for us, isn't it? We remember when, when we come to communion, we don't remember how good we are. We remember what Jesus has done for us. And we have to be able to say to our children who are holy, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. We have to be able to say that about our lives. Because when the Lord consecrated every firstborn male, he, what he is doing there is he is taking the firstborn male and he is making them as a representative of the household. So we vote for representatives. You vote for people to be on the church committee and they represent you on the church committee. You, you vote for people to be your elders and they represent you on the session and at presbytery and at general assembly. You vote for councillors to represent you on the county council. You vote for TDs to represent you in the Dáil. So this idea of someone representing us is what is being captured here. Just give me the firstborn male and they will represent the people before me. Now, theologians talk about this, that the firstborn male has been the federal head, as being the substitute for the household. So the firstborn male is like the substitute for the household. And this points forward to Jesus Christ, who is the substitute for us what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 20 to 24 is this. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So we see there that Christ is like, he is the firstborn son. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. So just as Adam, who was our federal head, who was our representative, sinned and brought death into the world, so Jesus, who is our federal head, who is our representative, redeems us. 
For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. So the Puritans in America had a weak catechism and one of the first things they had in it was a little rhyme that reminded the children this. In Adam's fall sinned we all. In Adam's fall sinned we all. So when Adam fell, he brought the whole race down with him because the whole race was within him. Everyone would descend from him and Eve. Just as when Christ ascended into heaven, he brought his people with him. He is our substitute. When Christ died on the cross, he redeemed his people. When Christ rose from the grave, he brought us out of our graves ahead of time with him. He is our substitute. He is our head. And this consecration of the firstborn is meant to point forward to Jesus. That's what it's about. It's getting into the people's minds generation after generation that you will have a substitute. You will have a representative. You will have someone consecrated especially to the purpose of redeeming you. And so we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 45 to 49 this. So what is written? The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So even though Adam was a living being, Jesus, the last Adam, was a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. So Adam was a natural man, but after him came Jesus, the spiritual man. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those of the earth. As is the man from heaven, so also are those of heaven. And there we see that picture. Just like the firstborn are substitutes, are representing the people, Adam as an earthly man represents those who are of the earth. You know, people who do not have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have not repented and trusted in him, have Adam as their representative. They have Adam as their head. But those who've been born again, those who have come to faith and repentance, have the heavenly man as their representative and their head, as their substitute, because they are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Now that's a rich sentence. Just as we lived in Egypt, so we will live in the promised land. Just as we lived in slavery, so we will be called out to freedom. Just as we lived with Adam as our head, so we will live forever with Jesus as our head. Just as we bore the image of the earthly man Adam as our representative, as our substitute, as our head, so shall we through faith and repentance bear the image of the heavenly man, the Lord Jesus, as our substitute, as our head, as our substitute as our representative at the right hand of the Father. You can see the deep truth that is taught through this Passover ritual. And so we read in verses 12 and 13 here, of chapter 12 of Exodus, that the people were to give over to the Lord, the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of the livestock belonged to the Lord. So they were to redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if they did not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. What was that meant to communicate and teach? Well, what was being taught here was this. The donkey was an unclean animal. The donkey did not have a cloven hoof, so it, it couldn't be eaten. It was unclean. And if they owned a donkey, even the unclean had to be redeemed with the clean. So the unclean donkey was redeemed by the clean lamb. And if the, if the donkey was not redeemed, it had its neck broken. Now that seems like a very severe thing to do.
but God wanted to communicate to the people what would be later communicated through the Apostle Paul, and that was this, that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death for the unclean. Unless they are redeemed with the blood of the Lamb, then the gift of God is eternal life. So we see the unclean redeemed by the clean, as the donkey is redeemed by the Lamb. We are donkeys. We are unclean. But we can be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Just as the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 to 11. You see, just at the right time, when we were still donkeys, Christ died for the donkeys. That's what that means. Just at the right time, when we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a donkey. Although for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. So you can see that donkey imagery. You know, if someone calls you a donkey, it's not a good thing, is it? And that's the power of that image in the word of God. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, but for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The lamb for the donkey the godly for the ungodly. Now, if we don't realize we're donkeys, forget about it. We can't even begin on this journey. If we think that we are uh, holy and perfect people just by merit of the family we were born into or whatever, forget about it. We have to realize our true standing before God. Since Christ died for us, since we've been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Now, the people in those days were saved from God's wrath. You know, the killing of the firstborn wasn't a matter of some evil force or the devil uh, wreaking havoc. It was the angel of the Lord who went through and took all those lives. It was God's wrath poured out on the people. It was the wages of sin. And the fact that the Israelites had to paint the blood on their doors to keep this out showed that they were just as deserving of death as the Egyptians. But since we've been justified by the blood of the Lamb, how much more shall we be saved by God's wrath through him? That verse 9 there is a picture of the Passover, and the Passover is a picture of it. For if when we are God's enemies, we are reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so? But we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We have not received reconciliation through earnestness of heart. We have not received reconciliation because we made an effort. We have not received re reconciliation because we made a decision. We have received reconciliation through the blood of Christ, through the blood of the Lamb shed for us donkeys, for us ungodly. That is the picture of the gospel that we see here in Exodus. We are brought out from under Adam. We are brought out from Egypt. And in verse 16 here of chapter 12, we can see that we are marked. And this consecration is like a sign on our hand and a symbol on our forehead. This inner consecration this true coming to faith and repentance that the Lord brought us out from Egypt with his mighty hand. Now, there's nothing in the book of Revelation that is not already said in the Old Testament. Uh, people say to me, they find the book of Revelation hard to understand. And I certainly think it's maybe one of the more difficult books in the Bible to understand. Maybe Ezekiel probably might be a bit more difficult. But the reason we don't understand the book of Revelation is that we don't know our Old Testaments. Because the book of Revelation is simply a rehash or a revisiting of the Old Testament. And the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation is a perversion or a turning upside down of this mark, the mark of the Savior. The mark on our forehead and on our hand, like a symbol that we are brought out of Egypt. Now, we don't literally have a sign on our head and uh, a mark on, on our hand to say that we're saved 
just like in the book of Revelation, people don't literally, it doesn't mean that people will literally have a mark uh, because this is what it's talking about. But we are marked in God's eyes. God can see those who have the mark of the beast and those who have the mark of the blood of the lamb. And there's only two types of people in the world. The book of Revelation, when it talks of the mark of the beast, it's not talking about microchipping or some weird thing like that. Everyone who has no faith in Christ already has the mark of the beast. You can't see it, but God can. And everyone who has faith in Christ already has this mark on their hand and on their forehead. God knows his own. They've had it since the Exodus. They still have it now. It is a spiritual truth of being consecrated. And anyone who is not consecrated to the Lord has the mark of the beast anyway. It's their natural state. And so we read in verse 15 that the people needed to be redeemed. It says there, when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn in Egypt, but man and animal. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. Each firstborn son, as a representative of his household, as a representative of his family, had to be redeemed, had to be bought out from under the sentence of death. Because the wages of sin is death. That's where we all start. But the gift of God is everlasting life. So be clear about this. The firstborn sons of Israel faced the same death sentence as the firstborn of the Egyptians. Without the blood of the lamb on the doors, that's what would happen to them. The firstborn of Israel had to be redeemed from God's judgment. They had to be redeemed from God's judgment. If they were not, and if the Israelites did not put the blood of the lamb on the door, they too would face the same judgment as the Egyptians. It wasn't just because they were born Israelites that they were being redeemed and that they were being spared this awful death sentence. It was because of the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Even though they were Israelites, if they had no blood on the doorpost, there was death would have visited that household that night. And this is a transaction made not with the devil or, or not with Pharaoh or not with anyone else. It is made by God with God. The books are balanced here, as it were, within the company. Some people think that when we're redeemed, when we're bought back, that we're bought back somehow from the devil. That, you know, a lot of, the way a lot of people talk about the devil, they make him into like almost equal to God. The devil is simply a dog on a leash to God. If you have a dog and he's a good dog and he does, does what he's told, you know, and, or any animal that you own, you have more control over him. Even an unruly dog, you have more control over them than say, a wild animal out there. You have them tamed, you have them trained, you know? And we often think that the devil is like some kind of wild animal, that the devil is somehow out of God's control, that the devil is a problem to God. But the devil is, is, is to God, just like your dog is to you. God can do with him as he pleases. He doesn't pose a problem to God. God doesn't have to redeem us from the devil because he, he somehow has managed to hoodwink God or pull one over on God. No, God is not redeeming us from the devil. He's redeeming us from himself. Because our problem is not the devil. It's, it's one thing to fall into the hands of the devil. And in the book, in, in the New Testament, Paul talks about handing people over to Satan. But that's only so that they might be chastised like Job was and not fall into a worse thing, a worse fate. The worst fate you could, that could happen to you is this, to fall into the hands of the living God. That's worse. That's the worst thing that could happen to anyone. For someone without faith or belief to fall into the hands of the living God, that's what we're seeing happening here. Those who are being the firstborn who are facing death in Egypt here are falling into the hands of the living God. God is saving them, not from sin, not from death because he's killing them. He's not saving them from the devil or themselves or something that's outside of him this is all happening within God 
God is redeeming these people from himself because it is he who will kill them. So, what happens here is a transaction is made between God the Father and God the Son on our behalf. Jesus shed his blood for us so that we would not face the judgment of God. Jesus faces God's judgment, bears death as the firstborn, so that we might not. The devil has nothing to do with it. He doesn't have a look in. This is all to do with God. A transaction is made between the Father and the Son on our behalf, and Jesus did not ask our permission to die for us. He adopted, we are adopted as sons through his death. So we're adopted as sons through the death of the firstborn for us. Just as the firstborn here are adopted and consecrated because of the blood of the Lamb and the death of the Lamb on their behalf. And that's why we read in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said this, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is the transaction that takes place. That's what happens. Jesus loves you and he gives himself for you. Just like the lamb, the innocent lamb with no sin was slain, it's bloodshed so that people not, might not face death. And the people should have died that night and in a way they did die. They died to Egypt. They died to their slavery. They died to their former lives and they were born into a new way of living, outwardly, outwardly. But as we see, many of them did not follow that through. But those of us who have genuine faith in Christ, for those of us who have genuine faith in Christ, this is not just an outward thing. It is first and foremost an outward thing, but that outward thing points us to the inward rebirth, to the inward life, to the real new birth. Those who can say this hand on heart, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. They are truly within. They are truly consecrated and not just outwardly. But those who cannot say, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me are without. They are not consecrated. They might be outwardly consecrated, but without that faith that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, the true meaning of the Passover, the true meaning of the blood of the Lamb, they are outward they are without and we see in verses one and two that the lord had this ownership over everyone anyway he said the lord said to moses consecrate to me every firstborn male the first offspring of every womb among the israelites who belongs to me whether man or animal so they were all his anyway they all belonged to him as God. He had power over them anyway. And so he calls us to this consecration of the firstborn. And we see also in verses 3 and 5 that Moses said to the people, commemorate this day, the day you come out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. So it is the action of God who saves us. We see in verse 5 also, that when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, it is the Lord who is doing the bringing. It is the Lord who saves, because it is he who swore to give. Here's a, an easy rule of thumb for you to judge between true and false religion. True religion is all about the Lord bringing us and the Lord doing for us, and the Lord and what he has done for us. False or dead religion is about what we do for God. Now, I have now and again heard sermons, and the whole point of the sermon is to encourage or whip people up or influence people or motivate people to do things for God. That's dead religion. That is dead religion. True preaching of Scripture and of the Gospel 
tells you what God has done for you. You take that to heart. And if you take that to heart, you will be able to do things for God and serve him and be motivated to do things for him without any preacher having to tell you to. That's true preaching of scripture. And so we see in verses 9 and 10 that this observance will be for you like a sign in your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips for the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You didn't bring yourself out. With his mighty hand, not by your good efforts, you must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. The people are told there is something they must do. There is something they must do. They're not told to be shocking good. They're not told to do this, that, and the other. They're not given a big to-do list. They're told at this point, remember every year at the appointed time what the Lord did for you. And it wasn't yourselves who brought yourselves out of Egypt. We see also then in verse 8, where it says this, On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me. There is a pattern of what we are to teach our children. Let me give you two ways to, to, to teach your children holy and sacred things. The first way you can do it is this. You can use Jesus and the Bible to discipline your children and make them be good. And you can simply use religion to try and make them into good, decent people. That's not what we're called to do. How we're called to raise our children in the faith is this, to tell them, here's what the Lord did for me. Here's what God did for me. I do what I do because of the, what the Lord did for me. And so it says in days to come when your son asks, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So how we're to teach our children is, is, is not telling them, pull yourself up by your bootstraps or try your very best to be good. We might tell them that apart from religion and apart from the Christian faith, just to be good citizens, that's a different thing. But as far as spirituality and religion is concerned, we're telling them, here's what the Lord did for me. Now, I said this to you before, and let me repeat it. Fathers, mothers, unless the Lord has done anything for you, unless the Lord has worked in your life with a mighty hand, unless the Lord has brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery, then you have nothing to tell your children. Mothers, fathers, if the Lord worked in your hand with a mighty, worked in your life with a mighty hand, if the Lord has brought you out of Egypt, and if the Lord has brought you out of the land of slavery, the onus and responsibility is on you to tell your son this when you ask him, why do we have to go to church? Why do we have to read the Bible? Why do we have to pray? Well, you tell them. There's only one reason. Because with a mighty hand, the Lord brought me out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's why. So here is the pattern for this consecrated life that the Lord calls us to. In Luke chapter 22 and verses 14 to 23, we see that when Jesus came, and let me, let me read this to you. When the hour came, Jesus, as an, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again, again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So our communion service is, I've said this before, I'll say it again, our communion service is not a church ritual. It is not a religious ritual that the church come up with. The words of Jesus Christ himself are, do this in remembrance of me. And if we don't, 
then we live in flagrant disobedience of him. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine at the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves, which of them, that it might be who would do this. And so we see that Jesus, even though Jesus knows that Judas is only outwardly consecrated and not inwardly consecrated, even though he knows that Judas is not genuinely a believer, but only outwardly belongs, he allows him to participate. But just because Judas sits at the communion table, just because he sits at the Passover table, it doesn't mean he's saved. Indeed, quite the opposite. He is accursed, he is cut off, he is an unbeliever. But Jesus still allows him to sit. But what is Judas doing? We see it here. He is eating and drinking judgment upon himself. And so we see again this picture of being brought out. We see it in verses 3, 4, and 5. Moses says to the people, commemorate this day, the day you come out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today in the month of Abib, you are leaving when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your forefathers to give you a land flown with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. So the Passover in the Old Testament, the Lord's Supper in the New, reminds us of our being brought out. That's why again we see in verses 8 and 9, on that day, I, on that day tell your son I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I come out of Egypt. We should be telling our children that at our communion service. This observance, the Passover or our communion meal, is like for us a sign on our hand and a reminder on our forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on our lips because the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. And so we see in verse 11, that after the Lord brings us into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to us as we promised on oath, to, to us and to our forefathers. So we are brought out of one estate and into the other. Out of Egypt, into the promised land. Out of death, into life. That's what the whole Christian faith is about. And so we read in verse 14 again, in the days to come when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The Passover here gives us a pattern for the Christian life and what it is really all about, being brought out from one thing and into another. And so we see again in verse 16 that this is to be like a sign on our hand and a symbol on our forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. Can you see how God is trying to get something across to us here? That it's all about being brought out of one thing and into, into another, out of the judgment of God, and into the favour and grace of God. We get a picture of this in verse 8 again, where it says, On that day tell your son I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Right, so we're coming out of Egypt, but where are we going to? Again in verse 14, In days to come when your son asks you, What does this mean? Say to him, With a mighty hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. That's grand. We're brought out of Egypt, but where are we going to? Well, we are not going to a strip of land in the Middle East. No, we are going to the real promised land that the land of Israel was just a picture of and just a road sign for. We are going to this place described in Revelation chapter 21. Here's how it is described. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. That's our promised land. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for our husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain 
for the old order of things has passed away. In the old covenant, even though the people lived in a land flowing with milk and honey, there was still death and weeping and mourning. We will enter in to this place where there is no death, no weeping, no mourning. The true promised land. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. Now, that echoes the words of Jesus on the cross, because Jesus is speaking here, it is finished. He has done everything for our salvation. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. Can you see that eternal life is a gift? It is, it, it is drank without cost. You cannot earn it. It is the gift of God is eternal life. He who overcomes will inherit all this and I will be his God and he will be my son. But just like the Egyptians came under the judgment of God, so those who do not believe and have not repented will come under the judgment of God. And so we read, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. That is not just something that old-fashioned fundamentalist preachers say. That is something that the Lord Jesus says. Those who practice the magic arts here, by the way, the Greek word there is pharmakeia, pharmacy. Now, that doesn't mean chemists are going to the lake of fire because they're chemists. But what was meant by magic arts there is probably like nothing we see nowadays. It was where people actually made potions, made of drugs, and gave them to people, and then they thought they'd put a spell on them. So they would, they would make up drugs and uh, give it to someone in a drink, and they would be drugged, but they wouldn't tell them they were drugged. They would say, I put a spell on you, and people would be terrified of them then. That was, that's pharmacia. That's what that is. That's what's meant by magic arts there. But these people who did all these things, but look here. The, the, the heading, the, the one here that really captures it all, the unbelieving. Someone might be brave. They might not be vile. They might never have murdered anyone. They might be sexually very moral. They might not practice drugging people. They might not be an idolater. They might very rarely or never tell a lie. But if they are unbelieving, they are still in this box. They are still under God's judgment, just like the Egyptians were. And so we see in verses 17 and 18 that this is all under God's plan. Uh, when the Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Now, this was all planned out. God was not reacting here, by the way, to the Philistines being there. It was not a contingency. You have to remember, God put the Philistines there. The Philistines didn't somehow creep in here without God seeing them. God didn't look and go, oh no, how did the Philistines get there? Now I have to bring them another way. No, God put the Philistines there so that they couldn't go that way. That's what's happening here. There's nothing beyond God's control. It's all planned out. God determined that it would be this way. And so we read in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 and verse 13. That no temptation has seized us except what is common to man. And that God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. When you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. God wasn't going to bring them through the Philistine lands, which he had put there, because he wanted to bring them another way, but also because he knew they wouldn't be able for the Philistines. If they were to meet the Philistines in battle, they, they just wouldn't be up to it. They would want to turn back. They would make that choice. So he said, I'll bring it another way. But this was all in his plan. It's all in God's faithful plan not to let them be tempted beyond what they could bear. In verse 19, we see that just as Joseph was the first to settle in Egypt, remember he was the first one there, so he goes out with them. And this points to a complete separation, an absolute 
and complete separation of the people of God. They're even bringing Joseph with them. This is why, this, is, this gives us a picture of what we read in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7, where it says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am the Lord your God. Just as the people brought even Joseph's bones with them, we are to consecrate ourselves and be holy. There's to be a complete separation in our having to do with God from the common and the profane, from worldly things, and we're to consecrate ourselves and be holy to him because he is the Lord our God. We also read in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 15 to 16 this but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. So we're called to be holy in all we do. Everything in life is to be to the glory of God. And we're to remember in everything that we're, we're consecrated to God's purposes. Now that doesn't mean that we can't do ordinary things. But when we're doing ordinary things, we remember they are ordinary things. We remember what's different from what is holy and what is profane. So we are called out as a holy people. And so the people camp here in verse 20 in Etham at the edge of the desert. And, you know, they're not just camping now overnight. This isn't just a fun day trip. But the rest of our lives from here on out is going to be one of camping in the desert. We see in verse 3, that the people are called out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And they're called to the promised land, but they're also called to live for 40 years camping, which is not a comfortable existence compared to what they had. In verses 6 and 7, also, we read how that they are to hold a festival to the Lord because and eat unleavened bread, and that no, no yeast is to be seen anywhere among them. Again, a picture of them been called out. So they're being called out to the desert to live a life in tents and to live a life without yeast, a life of repentance. Again, we see this reflected in the book of Revelation and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation and verses 19 to 20. Now, Jesus says this to the church in Laodicea, right? So he was specifically speaking this to one congregation. Okay, so it's important we remember that. This is a message for one congregation who no, which no longer exists. But maybe there are things in it that might apply to us too. Let's see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So again, we see the call of Jesus to a life of repentance. And in this life, he will be our guide. He will go ahead of us. He will hem us in behind and before. He will not allow us to be tempted by anything that is too much for us. This is why we read in verses 21 and 22. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way by night and in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. This is a reminder again that they are brought out by God. For we see in Genesis chapter 28 and verses 13 to 15 this. The Lord says, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give to you and your descendants the land in which you are lying that your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and the east, to the north and the south. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. So the Lord God is saying here to Jacob at the time, he is saying to Jacob, I will do it all. I promise, I swear on oath, it will, it will be all by my mighty hand. And that's why we read then in Exodus chapter 6, and verses 6 to 8. This is what, before all this happens, this is what God said to Moses. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. 
I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Let's just look at those verses again, and let me leave you with this thought. Here we have in Exodus 6, verses 6 to 8, the gospel. And here we have God saying in advance what he would do in chapter 13. Now, let me just in closing use these verses to contrast the gospel of life with the religion of death. You know, sometimes in the modern world, in drama and in films and in entertainment, you know, when we think of death cults and uh, Satanism and all this kind of stuff, it, it, it's just dramatic stuff that's imagined uh, to entertain people. But there is a real genuine death cult. There is a real genuine death cult that masquerades as Christianity. And its purpose is to bring people back into slavery in Egypt and to bring them to the second death. And it does that by taking them away from the gospel. So let us contrast the way of life with the cult of death. Here's the way of life. I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. The cult of death says, bring yourself out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. The cult of death says to you, free yourself, redeem yourself through your own good works, and through the strength of your own arm and your own goodness, you will achieve what it is that you need to do. Verse 7, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. The cult of death says that you will decide who will be your God. That you will essentially be your own God because you won't listen to the scripture but to your own heart. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. The cult of death says to you, bring yourself out. Bring yourself out through your good works and earnestness. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. The cult of death says, bring yourself out. And don't mind Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all that old-fashioned religion. That doesn't matter. In the here and now, you bring yourself out. This is the contrast between the true gospel, which is about what Christ has done for us, and the religion of death, which is about what you can do for yourself. Now, in everyday life, in common things, in our jobs, in our education, in our fitness, whatever it is, we have to do for ourselves. Yes, if you don't study, you won't pass the exam. If you don't work hard, you lose your job. If, if you don't try to lose weight, you won't lose weight. Those are common things. Those are everyday things. I'm talking here about holy things. Having to do with God is not like having to do with losing weight or doing a good job or studying hard in school. Having to do with God is relying completely on what he has done, not on what we do. And when we rely completely on him, he will equip us and strengthen us. He'll go behind us and before us, just as he did with the people in the Exodus. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you for love in our hearts for you. We ask you to deepen our love to you. Our love for you that we want to take these things to heart. That we want to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and not by our own goodness. That we will want to depend on you and not on ourselves. Lord, we thank you for giving us the strength to study, to work and to do the things that we need to do in life. But we know that when it comes to salvation, we must rely entirely on your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. 
Help us, Lord God, to see the Lord Jesus as our substitute, as our head, lifted up to draw all men to himself. Help us to see there is no way to you, Father, except through the blood of the Lamb and his merits. Lord Jesus, you are our substitute. You are our head. You were slain for us, our substitute, to reconcile us to God. Lord, we acknowledge that we deserve the judgment that the firstborn of the Egyptians faced. But we acknowledge that through faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can be brought out from Egypt. And when our children ask, may we be equipped to tell them that it is because of what the Lord has done for us. Lord, as we continue through this book of Exodus, would you give us the wherewithal, the spiritual insight to see just as it historically records the journey of the Israelites through the wilderness, so it is a spiritual picture for us of our journey through the Christian life. May we at each point take heed and note it and repent accordingly. But we can only do this by the power of your word and spirit. Lord, we pray for all who preach this message this day. May the message of the cult of death, of any religion that tells people, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, improve your standing before God by being shocking good, of any way of teaching that tells people that to be holy is to be a really, really, really good person. Lord, bring people out from under that and truly consecrate them. Truly consecrate them to the way, the truth, and the life that is not a religion of doing things, but the Lord Jesus Christ himself who loves us and gave himself for us. Lord, we pray for our leaders in this country that you would give them common sense and wisdom in continuing to govern us. We pray for all who work hard this week that you would give them strength to work. We pray for our children as they uh, try to learn as best they can at home and the parents who teach them, that you would give them strength. And Lord, that just as they learn their maths and their Irish and their English, that they would also be able to learn of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would have parents who believe and who are passionate and will want to say, well, here's how the Lord brought me out. Here's how the Lord with his mighty hand redeemed me. Lord, deepen our knowledge of you, just as we have knowledge of everyday things in life. So may we understand the things of the Spirit. But we understand that these are spiritually discerned. Give us spiritual discernment. Give us a passion to learn. Give us a devotedness to our consecrated calling. To follow the Lord Jesus and to spread the aroma of life everywhere that comes from him. Lord, we have all our own concerns and worries, especially those of us who have been bereaved recently and still grieve the loss of loved ones, and especially those of us who are sick and are struggling with illness, and especially those of us who worry because a loved one is ill. And so we commit all these worries, and those who are sick in hospital, and those who are sick at home to you, because we know, Father, you love us. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.